Good afternoon. My name is Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. This is the COVID-19 briefing for British Columbia for Monday, March the 15th. Uh, we're honored to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Songhees and the Esquimalt First Nations. Uh, tomorrow, Tuesday, we'll be providing, and Wednesday, we'll be providing uh, written briefings at around 3 o'clock with relevant information about the COVID-19 pandemic in British Columbia. Uh, and now, it is my honor to introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry. Thank you, and good afternoon. Uh, today, we're reporting on the last three periods from uh, Friday to Saturday, we had 555 new cases of COVID-19 diagnosed in the province. From Saturday to Sunday, an additional 491 people uh, were diagnosed with COVID-19. And again, from Sunday to today, 460 new cases. That uh, gives us a total of 1,506 new cases, including eight epidemiologically linked cases over this past weekend bringing our total number of people diagnosed with COVID-19 to 80, 88,373 in British Columbia. Uh, of the new cases, 382 are people who reside in the Vancouver Coastal Health Region, uh, 840 are in the Fraser Health Region, 75 people were on the Vancouver Island Health Region, 80 people in the Interior Health and 129 people in Northern Health. We now have uh, 4,987 active cases across the province. 269 people are in hospital, 76 in critical care or ICU, and over 9,000 people are now under active public health monitoring, uh, with 81,890 people who have recovered and passed their infectious period. Over this past uh, three days, we've had an additional 10 people who've died from COVID-19 in the province, bringing the total number of people who've died from this virus to 1,407. As always, at this point, our condolences are with the families, um, the care providers, and the, the communities who have lost loved ones. We've had uh, one new healthcare outbreak at uh, the UBC hospital, and uh, we now have six active outbreaks in long-term care uh, uh, and uh, independent living. There's no none at the moment in, in um, assisted living, and eight in different acute care wards. We have one new community outbreak that's been reported over the weekend at the, the Vitrium Glass Group. In addition, there have been 163 new confirmed cases that have been identified retrospectively to be variants of concern. So that uh, means of the total we've had in the last few months, 880 of those cases um, have been people who've been infected with one of these variants. Uh, of the total cases of variants, uh, 195 are still active cases, and the main remaining are past their infectious period. So this includes 818 people who have had uh, the B117 variant, 41 with the B1.351, uh, and 21 with the uh, P1 or Brazil variant. Um, as expected, most of these cases are in the Fraser Health and Vancouver Coastal Health Region, 681 in Fraser Health and 161 in Vancouver Coastal, plus uh, 8 on the Vancouver Island, 23 in the interior, and one now uh, confirmed case in the north. From the start of our COVID-19 pandemic, our provincial response has changed and adapted as we've learned as we've learned about the virus, as we've learned about the tools that we have available to us, where the risks are the greatest. And this will continue to be the case as we learn more about the variants, about how they're transmitted, about what is required to manage the ever-evolving challenges of this pandemic. A year ago, our focus was on slowing the spread. And now we have three safe and effective vaccines to protect people here in British Columbia and across Canada. With the majority of our seniors and elders in care homes now immunized and seeing how effective that has been, today our, our mass clinics 
for our seniors and elders in the community started off across the province. And I think this is an exciting day for all of us. It's the start of what is going to be ramped up quickly over the next coming weeks and months to be sure that everybody in British Columbia has access to one of our safe and effective vaccines. To date, 409,103 doses have been provided across British Columbia in every community in this province. Of those, 87,059 are second doses. And as you know, since we extended the interval with the knowledge that we have of the protection we get from a single dose, that has meant we have now been able to accelerate many of the um, immunization activities that we had started and we have accelerated our timelines for protecting people across the province. One of the important things that we do do is making sure that we understand the safety of every dose that's given to every person in this province and we follow strict protocols to identify and address any safety signals that show up and we've heard about this around the world. Um, we report uh, weekly on the adverse effects following immunizations, EFIs we call them. And uh, this is important. We look for anything that people might have that uh, would be, that could be related to the vaccine that they received within the time frame after they receive vaccine. And we know that there are many events that happen on a regular basis every day, whether it's people having car crashes, having heart attacks, and sometimes it'll happen in somebody who just happened to have received a vaccine. So it is important that not only do we monitor for all of these events, but we have a process to see if the events that happen are related to the vaccine or not. In BC, we've had 469 uh, AFIs that have, are serious that we've looked into. Uh, 46 of these were anaphylaxis or, or um, uh, it, uh, allergic reactions to the vaccine. Um, and we know that that is something that can happen when people are receiving any vaccine. And certainly we've seen it with these as well. These reactions aren't uncommon and we continue to monitor our distribution to make sure that there's not more associated with a single lot or not. As well, we have uh, trained people at every immunization clinic to be sure that if somebody does have an aller allergic reaction that they get the treatment they need, they need and the, the monitoring they need. We have seen reports in some countries uh, that have led to them suspending the use of certain lots of the AstraZeneca vaccine in some countries around the world. This has been linked to, as best we can tell so far, about 37 cases in several countries of, of uh, uh, issues or conditions related to blood clots, whether it's what we call a pulmonary embolus or a blood clot in the lung, whether it's a, a blood clot in one of the vessels of the heart. And we know that these things can happen, um, that these things can happen naturally uh, and in a population, they, they happen at a certain rate. But we also know that uh, they uh, are associated sometimes um, with COVID itself. We have to remember as well that over 17 million doses of AstraZeneca have been given. And so far, 37 cases of these uh, blood clots in different ways have been det detected. This is lower than we might see even in the general population without vaccination. So those are the types of assessments that are going on right now in places like the uh, EMEA in Europe, the World Health Organization, Health Canada is in touch with our counterparts in, in uh, the UK and in Europe to make sure that we have all of the information about what they're looking at, what lot numbers are involved, what products are involved. And we are confident that that is not a risk that we are seeing here in Canada with the AstraZeneca, the Serum Institute of India vaccine that we have here, the COVID Shield vaccine, and we'll be watching this very carefully. The other thing that I think is really important is, you know, this shows us that our safety monitoring is working, that we know that certain lot numbers might be uh, more associated with these than others and that the investigation is happening. But we also remember that every day some people have heart attacks, car crashes, etc. Sometimes these things happen in people who happen to receive immunization and we monitor to make sure that it's not greater than we might be expected. 
But we also know that infection with COVID-19 can lead to these types of conditions as well at a much higher rate. We have seen that here in BC, tragically, where we've had even young people have died at home from blood clotting, whether it's a heart attack or a pulmonary embolism. And we also know that the vaccines that we have are remarkably effective and safe, and the risk of having the vaccine is dramatically decreased compared to the risk of having COVID-19. There are no safety signals in the UK or in India or in Canada. And the best vaccine that you can take today to prevent you from getting the COVID-19 is the one that you receive first. All of our vaccines are safe and effective in BC. We know as well that vaccine appointments are now open for anyone over age 80, staggered over this week, and Indigenous peoples over age 65. And we've also heard, sadly, that some people are trying to take advantage of older people. And we've heard that there's been some, some scams that are happening. And I want to remind people, we will never ask you for your credit card information or for any payment. And if somebody does ask you for this type of information, they are not from the health authority. That's not the right number. And you need to hang up. So as you know, the bulk of our available vaccine, particularly the Moderna and the Pfizer shipments that we are now receiving on a regular basis, is focused on the foundation of our immunization program. And that is our age-based immunization program, starting with those who are most at risk, our seniors and elders. We also, and in, it's in phase three of our, our plan that we outlined several weeks ago, have a provision for being able to use additional vaccines that are approved. And the first of those has been the AstraZeneca Serum Institute of India Covishield vaccine. And the first um, reshipment that we received last week of this vaccine, about 60,000 doses, is being used right now to help us address community outbreak response. We knew that this was uh, in consultation with my colleagues in public health using the vaccine to help break chains of transmission in communities, particularly where we are seeing ongoing risk and transmission in clusters and outbreaks in workplaces. These are the outbreaks that are happening now, and this helps us to reduce the transmission that we are seeing in our community right now. In the coming days, starting this past weekend, we are focusing on those high-risk work sites that we have identified through this pandemic as the ones where we see transmission, where it's very challenging for people to be able to maintain their personal protective equipment when barriers are an issue. And we've seen outbreaks that have affected um, communities around the province, particularly in food processing plants, in agricultural operations with shared accommodations, We've seen outbreaks that have affected not just uh, the, the camps and the accommodations, but have spilled over into our communities in the large industrial camps, particularly the ones under the, the PHO industrial camps order with congregate accommodation for workers. And we know that these workers often fly in and fly out, and they can bring risk from the community that they are uh, in when they go into the camp and take risk home with them to places across British Columbia and across this country. Other large congregate living set in settings as well, where we know isolation and quarantine is difficult and outbreaks are ongoing and they're very challenging to control. So that is what we're targeting um, last week and this week and for the next couple of weeks with the, the COVID shield vaccine that we have. We know that many of these uh, people who work in these situations um, are low wage incomes, sometimes racialized populations, and it's important for us to be able to keep those, um, those workplaces safe for those workers, and we know that that also protects us in the community. I recognize that everybody is eager right now to get their vaccine as quickly as possible, and we will be doing that. It will be available for everyone. Everyone who is immunized also protects the rest of us. And when we immunize to manage these outbreaks that we are having right now, putting out those sparks reduces our community transmission and that protects us all. And it means that we all move up the line. I also um, 
we will also be uh, putting together, we, we expect to receive more of the AstraZeneca and uh, Serum Institute of India vaccines in the coming months. It has still not been worked out exactly how much we're receiving when, but uh, our BC Immunization Committee and our Public Health Leadership Committee have put together our guidance um, based on, on the ethical principles, on what we have uh, from the National Advisory Committee on Immunization, and in the coming days we'll be presenting this publicly so you will know who the next um, groups are on this, uh, this parallel track. So this is for the small amount of vaccine that we have that's different from our, our main program, which is the age-based um, immunization program. So those details will be coming soon. As well, I've been reviewing uh, the provincial health officer's orders. As you know, uh, we uh, amended the orders to allow for small outdoor gatherings. And we've started a process um, led by uh, Dr. Robert Daum in November to provide um, public health and myself with advice and expertise on faith services and religious services around the province. Over the past weeks, we've been working on how we can safely reopen in-person faith services, as I know how challenging it has been for many people not to be able to congregate with those who are in their faith community. Based on the advice, we will be providing a class var variance to allow outdoor religious services in small numbers in the coming days. And I'll be working with Dr. Dome and the reference group that, that he has uh, pulled together to create a class variance for Passover and Easter and to have these to people by early next week and based on the advice that we are getting from, from leaders in those communities. Finally, we are working on advice through the process with Dr. Dome on how we can have a workable approach to the gradual and safe phased reopening of ongoing indoor services for faith groups across the province for all faith services starting in April. And more details of that will be coming very soon. This is a time of hope as more people are immunized but it is also a time of caution. We still have community transmission and all of those things that we're doing to try and manage outbreaks in communities around the province, we know that more, some communities are affected more than others. The number of new cases is still very high, much higher than I would like it to be. We have very powerful means to push back the virus through our vaccines, but we also need to make sure that we're doing our part particularly in those higher risk environments when we're indoors, close to people, with numbers of people. It's important that we have our connections safe. And by that right now, it's focusing on what we can do together in small numbers outdoors. So I ask you to please make this small group of 10 a safe 10. Do it to protect those that you are closest to. Means, means we need to stay outside and continue with our safety precautions of fewer spa faces, open spaces and safety layers in place. Our pandemic is still here and we are still facing those headwinds, but we have lots of momentum now and we know that will push us forward. Each day more people are immunized, our shared protection increases and we get one day closer. And with each day we continue to be kind to each other, to be calm and to be safe. We will build our own momentum to get us through this phase of our pandemic. Thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And I wanted to start by uh, uh, passing on my condolences, those of the Premier, those of the government, those of I think everyone in BC, to the 10 people who passed away over the last three days, four from Friday to Saturday, three from Saturday to Sunday, three from Sunday to Monday in British Columbia as a result uh, uh, and linked to being tested positive to COVID-19. And it happened everywhere in BC. Three were in Fraser Health, two in Interior Health, one in Northern Health, four in the Vancouver Coastal Health Authority, a reminder of the enduring pain caused by this pandemic and the need to support one another in these very, very difficult times. We are never, uh, I don't think, a day passive or not reminded by somebody 
of the impact of and the challenges of grieving in these times and we are thinking of all of these families of the caregivers of the communities who've been affected by these losses throughout the pandemic and this weekend as well as you know uh, as dr henry has said 269 people are currently in a hospital dying of positive for covid 19. just to put that in context over the last week there have actually been more hospital beds available than there had been in the week precedent. Um, there are 9,374 base beds in our acute care settings in BC. 90.8% of those are full. To put that in context, in previous years that number would be over 100% of the base beds. And that leaves 863 uh, base beds empty and available for new patients. If you add base and surge bed, that's 11,923 beds, 72.1%. Of those are full and uh, the total number of available beds is 3,331. With respect to critical care, we have 532 base beds, 75.6% of which are, f uh, are full. That leaves 130 empty beds available for people. And there, when you count base and surge critical care beds, uh, we have 353 beds available with a, a current occupancy rate of 53.6%. Friday will be the first anniversary of the decision to suspend uh, non-urgent uh, scheduled or elective surgeries in BC and on that day we'll be providing and we'll be uh, making available reports laying out the effectiveness and what's happened with the surgical renewal plan in the year since then so that will be Friday. I want to acknowledge with some joy that we're down to three long-term care outbreaks, two in interior health and one in Fraser Health and considering that two months ago on January 15th we had 42 uh, long-term care outbreaks this is a significant uh, achievement of all of those who've made the effort to assist in immunizing uh, st staff and residents and many essential visitors in long-term care and assisted living no assisted living outbreaks three independent living outbreaks all in Fraser Health that reflects I think um, good news about the vaccine and what it's done in one part of BC and the hope that we'll, can, we'll be able to see some continuing re uh, restoration of a, of a more normal situation in our long-term care homes very soon. Uh, the, yesterday uh, we announced that we were moving up the, the appointment booking um, in British Columbia that we were adapting and accelerating that booking across BC. So today as you know at noon uh, people born in 1937 or above, aged 84, are allowed to start booking uh, their appointments starting at noon, noon tomorrow. That will be people aged 83, born in 1938 or before. On Wednesday, it will be people aged 82, born in 1939 or before. On Thursday, people aged 81, born in 1940 or before. And um, in, uh, in, on Friday, it will be people aged 80, born in 1941. And before more than 10,000 people booked their appointments this morning in BC before the, it opened to the new cohort and we are expecting a significant increase in the number of people booking appointments when we report on that at the end of today. I just want to note uh, Dr. Henry and I in a statement earlier today talked about how we were deploying the first amount of uh, AstraZeneca we've received uh, in British Columbia and some of the steps we're using to, to use vaccine to deal with transmission in community beside our age-based approach and all of you know all of you know that with our vaccine campaign we said we'd start with the most vulnerable and those who care for them and then move down through age groups because science and our experience with COVID-19 said that was the right thing to do and that is what we are doing right now and when our supply was less certain in the month of January we adapted to make sure we did not waver I think British Columbians understand this and support this. And whether it's vaccines to Prince Rupert with a significant community outbreak or to workplaces anywhere in BC where case numbers are high and threaten local, regional or provincial safety, our BC way is to support this targeted effort. And I think British Columbians understand and support this as well. Let's be clear, everyone, everyone in BC is essential in our BC pandemic. From our individual action to stop the spread right through to our collective action to ensure that everyone who needs a vaccine gets one and that everyone who wants a vaccine has one. From the start, we've been guided by our commitment that those who need it most are the highest priorities for all of us and we will continue to uphold that principle. And I don't, I don't just think British Columbians support this, I know they do. Just to say finally, 
that this weekend was a bit of renewal. Clocks, uh, setting clocks forward gave us more light in the evening and uh, the opportunity to take uh, advantage uh, uh, and the encouragement from uh, public health from Dr. Henry to, to go outside, I think, raised our spirits. These welcome changes are set against two important backdrops. One is the encouragement we get from knowing that vaccines are being administered across the province with 7.49% of us now having had our first, uh, first dose. And the second is the reality that COVID-19 remains everywhere in BC. Sometimes we might find it harder to do what we know is right in our BC COVID fight when the lure of longer days and the chance to gather outside once again sparks in each of us our zest for life as I think it did this weekend. The ability to gather outdoors in groups up to 10, the same 10, is an important step in our BC pandemic and we all make outdoor gatherings for up to 10 people safe by keeping tight with the trusted 10 we're part of. There has been some positive news in the past week, especially about vaccines, but our way to sustain it and give vaccines their best chance to save lives is to keep using the skills we've been taught to stop the spread, keep adhering to the guidance and orders that save lives, and keep doing what's right in our COVID-19 fight. Aujourd'hui, nous faisons le point sur le nombre de nouveaux cas pour trois périodes de référence de 24 heures chacune, soit celle du 12 et 13 mars, celle du 13 et 14 mars, et celle du 14 jusqu'au 15 mars, en mi-journée. Il y a eu 10 nouveaux décès liés au COVID-19 durant ces périodes de référence. Nous offrons nos condoléances aux familles et aux amis des 1407 personnes décédées de COVID-19 et à tous ceux qui ont perdu leurs proches euh, au cours de cette pandémie. Pour la première période de référence qui s'étend jusqu'au 13 mars, nous avons eu 555 nouveaux cas. Pour la deuxième période de référence, nous avons eu 491 nouveaux cas. Au cours des dernières 24 heures, 460 nouveaux cas se sont ajoutés. Parmi l'ensemble des cas confirmés de COVID-19, 269 personnes sont actuellement hospitalisées, euh, dont 76 en soins intensifs. Merci beaucoup. Thank you very much. We're happy to take your questions. Thank you, Minister. As a reminder to everybody on the phone line, please press star 1 to enter the queue. You're limited to one question and one follow-up only. I would also ask that you please remove yourselves from mute. You are not audible until your name is called. First question today is from Rob Shaw, Czech News. Rob, are you there? Yep. Can you hear me? Yep. Go ahead. Okay. Sorry. Uh, to Dr. Henry, I was hoping you could talk about the decision. I think we lost you, Rob. Okay. We'll come back to Rob. Let's move on to Richard Zussman, Global News. Uh, for both Dr. Henry and Adrian Dix, there's been a lot of frustration over the weekend. I'm sure you've heard around Pfizer being used from some larger companies and workplaces here in BC, including now a cabinet maker. Can you explain why these companies are being prioritized with Pfizer? Why not close down some of these businesses, ask people to isolate as we've seen with outbreaks and other positive cases, especially because it takes up to three weeks for the vaccine to work? Can you explain that part as well? And are you worried about prioritizing these businesses, meaning other businesses, may want to have outbreaks in order to access the vaccine. I, I would hope not. I don't think anybody wants to get sick with this virus. And it is, a, it is a reality that we have been focusing on outbreaks in our communities and we use the vaccine that we have available. We used it to manage outbreaks that we had in uh, um, correctional facilities, for example, to manage outbreaks that we've had in certain areas. And, and these are, the businesses are closed down when they have an outbreak to make sure that we are able to effectively isolate people. All of those other things are in place as well. But what we have have learned from some of these larger workplaces, um, particularly uh, we've seen this repeatedly with some of the food processing plants and, and a number of those were uh, workplaces that were uh, that vaccination was part. It was one of the part of the outbreak control measures. So yes, we do close them down. Yes, we do um, make sure that people are isolated, that they're tested, that they have to stay home, that their family and their close contact are isolated as well. But we now have another tool 
that we now know is effective in helping us prevent that ongoing transmission that happens in families and communities and back and forth into the workplace. And so those have been prioritized and will continue to be prioritized with the vaccine now that we have uh, uh, from uh, the AstraZeneca because it's much more flexible. Um, we're able to keep it in the fridge and use it in smaller amounts. But we need it to take the actions that we've been doing in various outbreaks around the province since we've had vaccine available, but only since we've had enough available that we've um, been able to focus on some of those smaller uh, clusters and outbreaks as well. So it is part of our public health response to putting out uh, the, the community outbreaks. It's not about prioritizing one specific industry. It's about addressing uh, the outbreaks and clusters that are ongoing in our communities now that lead to that extra layers of transmission. And we're going to see more of that. That is what we're using this, this alternate or parallel track for to best protect and stop transmission in the community. And uh, we'll be having more details about that. But right now, that means looking at, at some of those industries where we have ongoing repeated uh, transmission events and outbreaks that are making people sick that they're bringing home, that they're taking, uh, that people are ending up in hospital, and where workplaces are very challenging to make safe. So uh, we we do all of those things in those workplaces. Richard, do you have a follow up? Yes, there's just one point there around some of these businesses don't seem to be essential, like processing, like making glass or cabinet, and you can address that. But I'm also have to ask for a colleague about. Uh, patios. And, and one of the things in your order last week around outdoor settings is there's been some confusion about whether that means people can go with friends to a patio now. And the restaurant industry is saying that is not the case. Can you explain the rationale behind not including patios as somewhere that people can now gather outdoors? Uh, they certainly can gather outdoors, but the same, and I, I emphasized this last week, the same restrictions are in place in, in uh, bars and restaurants and pubs. And so, yes, outdoor patios, but the maximum is six. So that's, that's related to the, the premises themselves. Those same safety protocols are in place. So it's six if you're in a restaurant um, and, and you're out on a patio. Um, if you're out in the park having a, a picnic, if you're playing, uh, uh, going skating with some friends in the north right now, I know it's still uh, cold up there, you know, then limit your, your group to 10. Um, in terms of businesses, it's not, we've not deemed businesses essential. Um, you know, there are, everybody is essential. There are many things that are essential to our, our, our livelihoods, our, um, our social and emotional well-being and other things. What we are looking at is the businesses that are operating, that are operating using COVID safety plans, where there is uh, an ongoing risk in the workplace to workers in those settings. And we have done a lot of analysis of those settings, and there are some where it's more challenging. There's larger numbers of people. It's more challenging for the COVID safety plans to be adhered to, and it has effects on workers safety that reflects into uh, our communities. And so that's why we're focusing on the ones that uh, we know need to stay open or stay open, the agricultural, where we're in uh, group living accommodations, uh, where there's um, uh, the, the food processing plants, some of the light industrial plants are, are important, uh, some of the manufacturing where there's larger numbers of people who, and workers where it can spread very easily, um, and some of the, uh, the mail depots and, uh, and uh, distrib distribution centers as well. So it is where outbreaks are happening in our community right now. Everybody is essential, we know that. Okay, we are going to go back to Rob Shaw. Go ahead, Rob. Been there, but uh, Dr. Henry, I wanted to ask you about the decision to bump up the for the second time the age cohorts yesterday. Is there a ripple effect of that that extends to the other ages that were outlined on March the first when he gave us a list of the seventy-year-olds and sixty-year-olds, and all the way from basically April to September? Are we bumping? those people up now a week and and how does that work absolutely yes you know that that's as we're building up momentum we want it to start off with uh, try and 
um, as best we can, make it easier for um, people as we're getting our clinics up and running. And so many of the clinics now are ones that will be expanding as we uh, as we go down the age cohorts. We're talking about larger and larger groups of people. So this has been our way to try and and ramp it up in a way that's effective and uh, uh, make sure that people get what they need in terms of access to the clinics. And yes, we will be ramping up and increasing uh, the other age groups as soon as we are able to. Thanks, thanks for the question, Robin. I, I think it's important to recognize as well is that well, we need to adapt to the key issue that still faces us, which is when vaccine arrives. And it presents daily challenges. Some, day, some weeks we think it's coming on Tuesday and, uh, and it comes on Wednesday, which presents some challenges, particularly in the organization of public clinics. And uh, in, the, in the case of this present period, we've received somewhat more vaccine in this period between or are going to between March 15th and March 31st. So we have to adapt. Uh, to that to ensure that we're getting vaccine into people's arms um, as fast as we can. We're actually expecting in the last week in March to receive just somewhat more vaccine than the next week in April. So when we see opportunities to accelerate, we want to accelerate and set appointments and that's precisely what we're doing. And in the case of today, for example, uh, everyone 84 uh, who is at least 84 years of age, born in, uh, in 1937 or before, will be are able to sign up now for appointments. The idea is that we're going to have to, throughout this process, continue to adapt. And our expectation is that, unlike in January, most of that adaptation is going to be to accelerate. Uh, the opportunity for people to get uh, their vaccination. So that's what's happening now, and it's really positive. I think it's positive that we're instead of going 85 to 89 today, we're we're moving on through this week, uh, so that people down to the age of 80 will know when they're going to get their vaccinations. Follow up, Rob. Sure. Thanks. I guess I'd just like to ask about: Are you worried about any confusion, given that we've gone from very specific dates just a couple of weeks ago to now a week in which you know, if you're 83 or 84, 82, you have a different day to, um, to, to potentially open up. And then also, I'm sneaking a, another question there. Can you continue to bump things up without an online booking system? Or do we hit a, a kind of age cohort where you need that online backup to handle the demand of, of people? Yeah. yeah, you know, I, I think this is, I think slowing things down would make people confused, but speeding things up is, is if anything, a more positive thing. So um, it, it, we're adapting to what we're getting. And that's been the way that we've tried to do this. We wanted to, to you know, set expectations and, and make sure that we had the, the vaccine that we needed on hand, the clinics ready to go, the, the number of vaccinators and everybody else that's involved with the clinics ready to go. But as we get into the momentum, we want to increase rapidly. And uh, that's what we're trying to do and trying to make sure that we're keeping pace with the vaccine that we're receiving. And we're getting um, ongoing changes uh, it, at the national level as well. Um, the federal government is working very hard to, to front end load. As we talked about even two weeks ago, um, or two and a half weeks ago when we presented some of the details, you know, we had now have changes in that uh, from the national level where they've been able to um, bring forward some of the uh, uh, supply that wasn't meant to come until later in, uh, later in the year. So that's good news for us and what we need to do is adapt to try and use that up um, and get uh, vaccine into arms as quickly as possible to as many people as possible. So um, I, I think it is important for us to speed things up if, as we can. What we're, We are being very cautious because we have seen, as uh, the minister mentioned, we've seen before where uh, vaccine shipments have been delayed for reasons that we don't know. And of course, we were a little gun shy through much of uh, February because we had such small quantities of vaccine for a number of weeks. Um, but we're more and more confident that not only are we going to receive what we expect to receive, but it's actually increasing. So that's that's good news, and it's going to be an all-out effort. 
And yes, uh, we are working very hard on making sure we have the online, provincial online process that everybody can use. And uh, the target for that is still, unfortunately, a few weeks away. But we want to make sure that it works and it works well. And these things, uh, for anybody who's developed uh, an IT system like this that has to be interoperable with many other systems. And most importantly, from my perspective, is it gets everybody's information into our provincial immunization registry. So one, you have a record. We have a record, so some point when you need that record. But also, really importantly, that's our safety monitoring system as well. So yes, we're, we're trying to speed things up as much as we can, um, and that is something that we're working very hard on, and we're going to be test driving in the next little while, and it will be ready to go um, once we get into our major cohorts of uh, 70 and, and above. Um, so probably not until April. Um, so we're going to have some combinations before we get to that. Next question is from Martella Bernardo, News 1130. Hi, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix. I'm hoping to ask you to clarify more about what's happening with religious groups because uh, I think I heard you say that you can have small gatherings outdoors before April, but not until April will people be allowed to have indoor uh, religious services. If you could just clarify what the timeline is. Yeah, so we are working uh, with uh, the um, Rabbi Dome has uh, has a, a panel, if you will, of different uh, faith leaders who have been so helpful. Uh, it's like um, each of the other sectors that we worked in. Um, so with sport, we had Via Sport and representatives from different sports to help us develop uh, the guidelines for how we can have sport reopening. And that that's coming as well in April. So there's three things that we are looking at in the last couple of weeks uh, through this process with, uh, with Dr. Dome. One is uh, about outdoor services. And so we have come up with some guidelines for outdoor services, and we'll be looking at uh, uh, putting a class variance, it's called, uh, to in the next couple of days that with the guidelines for how safe outdoor services can be held for religious groups who want to do that. And let me make this very clear, and I've heard this from many faith leaders, that they understand that we're still in a very precarious situation, um, and some communities absolutely are not yet ready um, to have in-person services. And some communities, um, it can be done perfectly safely. So um, these are the things that we are putting in place with their advice. The second one is around um, the, the important holidays. So uh, we know that for, uh, for Christians, Easter and uh, for people of the Jewish faith that uh, Passover are two very important holidays that are coming up at the end of this month. So we have been consulting through this process to, to see how we can have some limited in-person gatherings for those very important um, celebrations and do that safely. And again, it will depend. Um, I've heard from uh, the leaders in those communities that you know, some, uh, some churches or synagogues are finding other ways to have those services. But for some, um, it will be very important to have some limited indoor um, access for those important uh, celebrations. And we're looking at how we can do that. And we'll have uh, guidance on that. Uh, I'm hoping early next week for people. And then finally, we're using the process to help understand how we can have a phase safe reopening to uh, in person religious services across the board over the next few months. And uh, the, the target for that, um, based on the advice that uh, I'll be getting, we'll be getting in the next uh, few weeks, I, I'm hopeful um, that, that we're looking at sometime in, in the middle of April. So those are all um, flexible, uh, depending on the advice that I'm giving about what are the important things that we need to take into consideration. Then, of course, from the public health perspective, um, you know how much transmission we're seeing in what communities and our public health resources to be able to manage and, and work with on outbreaks and, uh, and clusters and the case and contact tracing that's so important. So those will all drive how we can do this over the next few months. Follow up, Martella? I do, and this is going to be, I'm going to try to ask this so that you can possibly provide a yes or no answer so that it's fairly clear. Because last week I was given a letter 
um, access to a letter about um, a FISA, independent school administrators being told that they need to fall within provincial guidelines. And a lot of people have misinterpreted that or may not have misinterpreted that to mean that if you have mandatory masks in schools right now, um, you're not encouraged to do that. So can you clarify yes or no if people are administrators of these independent schools are now being told that they are not allowed to make masks mandatory if they believe that that is a good safety measure to implement? So, as you know, we have a policy, a public health guidance for all schools. And the public health guidance is based on what we know is uh, uh, the, the, the measures that we need to have in place to help protect uh, all people in the school community. And that includes uh, provisions for, for mask wearing. So there is mask mandates in the public health guidance. And then each school district, each school and, um, allows, uh, puts the operational pieces in place uh, using those guidelines. So we have public health guidance, and then there's Ministry of Education directives that are based on the public health guidance, and those are enforced in the schools with a partnership between the school district, the school principal, and the school health officer in that area. Next question is from Binder Sajjan, CTV. Back to the variants uh, that were retroactively um, discovered. Um, when you discussed the results of the point prevalence survey uh, that was done in late January, February, you said that out of about 3,000 cases, three were found to have a variance of concern. But I think your modeling presentation on Thursday indicated maybe dozens of cases. Um, so are you able to just clarify how many cases did the survey actually uncover? Uh, if there's a discrepancy, why that is, and if there's anything that you would have done differently? Yeah, so uh, there, there, there was two phases to that. Uh, one of them was a screening test, and the screening test looked for a specific mutation, the, the N501Y, and there was about 30, so about 1% uh, were positive for the screening test, and that was some of the data that I reported at the modeling. And then there were three of those uh, that had been done at the time that I reported it. So it was slightly higher, and then we've added some additional uh, screening uh, tests in there. So uh, we're now probably about 10% of our new cases are at least screen positive as a variant and then go on for, for whole genome sequencing. So we have seen an increase, um, but I can uh, give you the, the details of, of the specific 3,099 and there was about 30 and then three that were positive and then on a whole genome sequencing of additional ones that uh, identified a few more and I can't remember uh, off the top of my head, but I can get you those details. Binder, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thank you. And uh, this is uh, for a colleague of mine. What would be the harm in pausing uh, the use of the AstraZeneca vaccine until, you know, the link to blood clots has been absolutely ruled out? Um, and does the fact that many of these doses are set to expire April 2nd play into the decision to carry on uh, with vaccination rather than uh, suspending it? Yeah, so I think we, um, you know, I tried to put that in, in perspective. We see safety signals um, arise now and then with any new vaccine program. And uh, we've been following very carefully with Health Canada, um, looking at what the concerns were, what the lot numbers were. So the countries that have suspended it have uh, had similar uh, product with similar lot numbers. Uh, it's We've not seen any of these safety signals in, in the UK which is a country that we uh, exchange a lot of information with and nor have we seen it with the product that we have here in Canada. So we have the, the COVID shield here, these, uh, these small number, let me just <laughs> re-emphasize that, small number of events associated with the AstraZeneca product that was used in, in Europe. Um, the, it's not the product that we're using here, but we also don't believe that the, the, there's a, um, an underlying uh, reason why it would be associated with those, and the investigation is ongoing. The WHO has looked at it. EMEA in Europe has said that they don't believe there's a link. So we are uh, following the advice of our regulator, looking at it very carefully, and uh, right now it does not 
up here, as uh, most countries have recognized. So no, it's not about the expiration date. It's about the position that we are in right now, where it's important for us to get these vaccines uh, to get people protected with vaccination as quickly as we possibly can. And these are another safe and effective vaccine that's in our armamentarium. We have time for one more question. For everyone listening, Dr. Henry and Minister Dix will release a statement this afternoon with the latest information on cases, hospitalizations, and outbreaks, which you can find at news.gov.bc.ca. For updated province-wide restrictions, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID restrictions. And for information about the province's orders and pandemic supports, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. Last question today is from Tanya Fletcher, CBC. Dr. Henry, uh, documents show Canada is about to change its guidelines on the AstraZeneca-Oxford vaccine and recommend it be given to those over the age of 65. Does that mean seniors in BC could also be offered it, especially if AstraZeneca shipments pick up, or will it continue to only serve that parallel track and not merge into the age-based system? Yeah, so we are, um, right now, our plan is to continue with our, our um, our parallel track as a way um, to try and essentially go at both ends. The vast majority of our, our vaccine is in the age-based program, but this allows us the flexibility. And, and the flexibility is really because it's a fridge-stable vaccine, so that makes it much easier for us to take it to workplaces and other places. And yes, um, workers who uh, we had discussed uh, with our immunization committee here, whether we would restrict it to workers who are under age 65, um, we all felt that uh, we didn't need to do that, so uh, we'll see. Uh, the NACI statement is supposed to be coming out, I, I believe, in the next few days, um, and it will just add a, a level of comfort. Um, but uh, real-world experience, and we've seen some really good studies now from the UK in particular, from Scotland um, and, and uh, uh, India, some other countries that are using a lot of the AstraZeneca vaccine, that it is safe and effective in, in older people as well. So that's reassuring. Tanya, do you have a follow-up? Yes, thanks. Is there concern that once the entire town of Prince Rupert is vaccinated, for example, that people might be less careful in terms of masking and gatherings, etc.? What's your message to people living there? Yeah, you know, I think there are many communities now around the province where uh, First Nations communities, some of the smaller communities where it doesn't make sense to go back multiple times. Um, we, we all need to recognize that right now we still have a lot of transmission of this virus and the vaccine is not 100 percent. So we need to be respectful of each other. It does mean that after um, particularly, you know, two to three weeks at least, uh, we know that the, the, the effectiveness of protection goes up quite dramatically. So we need to keep things in place, particularly if we're around somebody who is older, um, who is uh, has immune compromising conditions, more at risk for, for severe COVID. We need to continue to use our protections until we're all at that place. Um, but we do know now, you know, we're learning as we go with these vaccines, uh, that uh, three to four weeks after uh, our immune system is able to build up that response, we are able uh, to, uh, you know, we are protected in a, in a, a broader sense. Um, but we also know that we're connected. We've learned that through this pandemic, that people move and we take risk from where we come and we bring the risk back from where we've been. So it, it is not, uh, we're not safe until we're all safe. And we've said that all along too. So we do need to continue to be careful over these next few months as we protect more and more people in the province. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you for joining Thank us. You.